This video tutorial is brought to you by BenQ and its professional monitors line. Hello, my name is Zug Guerre and welcome to another edition of Hugo's Desk. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a director and a visual effects supervisor working in London. I have been working in the industry for 17 years, worked for the mill for five years as the head of the new compositing department, and currently I'm a director and visual effects supervisor at Fired Out Smoke, where I work in trailers and cinematics for many AAA games. In this video, I will talk about the basics of color correction and grading. I'll be using Nuke in this video, but this technique can be used on any composting or grading package. The most important part of being a successful artist, in my view, is to be software agnostic. So as much as I love working in Nuke, this video can be used by any artist doing color correction. You can use Fusion, After Effects, DaVinci, or any other professional visual effects package. It's essential to use the best monitors for color correction. So I will be using the BenQ PV3200PT and the BenQ PD3200U. The first one as my main grading monitor and the second one as my desktop monitor. These monitors are Technicolor certified and they have 4K resolution with full 10-bit support. I will also be using the 4K scopes to control my color correction. But without further ado, let's just get started. Like I said on the introduction, this is going to be all about color correction today, and it's very software agnostic, really. So don't be afraid of seeing Nuke open in the screen. I kind of want to show you the basics of color correction, and I think Nuke for me, because it's the software I've been using for so, for so long, I'm more used to Nuke, but uh, Nuke has a, a really good tendency to be such a complex software that actually it helps you to learn other softwares. I can tell you, for example, from experience, that ever since I started using Nuke, I became a much better After Effects artist because uh, Nuke kind of allows you to understand under the hood what's actually going on uh, in terms of the mathematical part of compositing because compositing is all about mathematics and color correction is all about mathematics as well. It's all about grading of multiplication of pixels and uh, demultiplication, division of pixels. So in a way, it's all a big math puzzle really. So. But let's just get on with this. So as you can see here, this, I'm sorry about this image. This is a shoot that I did a few years ago. I supervised it, uh, directed by Peter Martin uh, in LA, and I was on set supervising it. So one of the things that I want to start with is to show you the actual differences between uh, the highlights, the midtones, and the dark areas of the image. So I'm going to really quickly, uh, just so you guys know, this is a quick time directly from an Alexa camera. So this is a raw, uh, not a raw, sorry, it's a ProRes 444 a shot in an Alexa. As you can see in here, it's with the default color space of Alexa V3 Log C. We'll talk a bit about this in a minute, but this is like basically the best quality you can get from the Alexa without using RAW. So it's a ProRes. Um, and as you can see, it has multiple highlights and multiple dark areas in midtone. So I'm going to start by just giving you a little basics when you look at the three fundamentals of color correction which is the highlights, and it's the midtones, and the actual darks or shadows. Those are three fundamentals, and they are fundamentals that will work on any other application. So I'm for that matter, I'm going to use in Nuke a node called Grade Node. And in this node, you do have these three things. So we're going to basically focus on the multiply, which is or gain, which is the same thing, by the way. So the multiply or the gain is your highlights. It's the brightest area of the image. And then I'm going to talk about the gamma, which is the midtones, or what we call the skin tones. For a photographer, it's usually the skin tones. And then the lift, which is the darks, or uh, basically the shadows. Now, I'm going to show you uh, really quickly what exactly happens uh, on an image that has like that. So, for example, here, you can see that the sphere is quite overexposed. You can kind of see that when I sample my pixels, you can kind of tell that it's five uh, value. 
at the moment. And so, for example, if I lower the exposure on my viewer, you can clearly see both on the image and also on the vector scope that actually all my highlights, which looked like they were clamped, so you can see here on the vector scope, you can kind of see that there's like a cutting point, which is the limit of your highlights. You can kind of see as I lower my f-stop down, you can kind of reveal all that image. And this is one of the powerful things of using raw formats on a camera. Whenever you have the opportunity, you should use a raw format. You know, If you're using a 5D, you should use raw on your camera. If you're using an Alexa, you should use raw or at least ProRes with a log. And of course, if you use a Blackmagic camera, you should use uh, uh, raw as well. It will give you more latitude uh, for color correction. So as you see here on the on the scopes, actually, um, and by the way, these scopes that I'm using is the software called Scopebox. You can also use 4K scopes as well. I have them on the screen so you can have a look at them. Uh, I use both of them for different things, really. Uh, so as you can see here, as I lower my multiplication, I am lowering my highlights. Now, as you can notice on the image, if you look at the vector scope, I'm only affecting the half top of the image. That means that I'm not really affecting the bottom. As you can see, the shadows in the dark areas are really not changing at all. That means I'm actually compressing and basically multiplying the values. So I'm basically making it more small. And that's why it becomes darker, because I'm actually multiplying it by three. Now, why is it called multiplication? It's called multiplication because that's exactly what it is. If I go here and sample these pixels, you see these pixels are 4 uh, 0.8, 4.9, 4, uh, 3.9 on red, green, and blue. But you see, if I go here and do by half, you can clearly see that now it's 2.4, 2.4, 1.9. And if I put by two, I have now multiply it by two. So for every pixel that I am selecting in the image, so for example, if I select one of these blue pixels in my shirt, for example, Normal values is 003, 004, 008. So if I multiply it by two, you see that you get the double of that. You, so it's like what I was saying in the beginning. Compositing and color correction is nothing like a mathematical equation. So if it's 03 of that pixel, if you multiply it by two, it becomes 06. And if you multiply it by uh, five, it becomes times five. If I split it by half, then it becomes half of that value. This is really important for you to understand because that's why the multiplication and the gain controls only affect the highlights. Because if you multiply a pixel of zero by two, you get zero. That's the thing, like nothing will happen. And so multiplying pixels that are dark doesn't really matter because if it's black, it's black. It doesn't really move. That's what you need to keep in mind. So on the other hand, there is this section of the highlights, which I'm affecting. Now let's talk about the gammas, which are the midtones. Now, if I start changing the midtones, you can clearly see in your graphic on the vector scope here that actually everything moves. So I'm basically affecting the middle section of the image because middle tones or midtones or anything that is considered that is not black or it's not white. So if you think of white being pure one, that's really a highlight, that's top. And then you have blacks, which is zero. So everything in between is a midtone. And that's why photographers usually talk about midtones and they talk about skin tones because those are like the gray values, you know. So, um, for example, if I change here on my gamma, you can kind of see that I can change just the midtones. And as you can see, the highlights stay as they are in the sphere. You can kind of see that, that they are still very bright and the blacks kind of stay where they are. Of course, there's no pure black on this image. The last but not least is the lift. Now, the lift is what we call the shadow. So if you look at the vector scope here, you can clearly see as I move the lift, I'm actually compressing the bottom. So I'm, I'm basically moving my black pixels or gray pixels above. So I'm basically switching them to become brighter. And that's why it gets a compression. You see the midtones in the middle here. So you see these on the bottom here or the actual uh, dark pixels that used to be dark. And then on the middle, there's the midtones, and then on the top, there's the highlights. And so that's what the lift does. The lift basically is like it, the name says, lifting the shadows, lifting the black areas. 
to show you this a bit more in action, I'm actually going to open up another type of image, uh, just just to make it a bit fresh. So this is a, a piece of image shot in an Alexa as well. This was done for a short film that I supervised uh, called The Fields. Um, and so this is like a sci-fi short film. Of course, you can click on the link to actually see the film, just like you saw on Baby Teeth as well. And so in here, we have the same kind of deal. So I'm going to put another great note here, and I'm going to show you this in great effect. Effect. So as you can see here, if I multiply down, you can see the highlights on these windows are now revealed. If I gamma up, I can now basically get the image a bit more gray, a bit more washed out, or I can get the image much more contrasted. And then, of course, the lift is basically giving color to the dark areas. So keep in mind that whatever you give on the lift, you're basically adding color or adding values to the shadows or to the dark areas. It's almost like if you would have tinted, for example, if you wanted to tint the shadows in some kind of light. So imagine if it's a sunny day, you could tint it with some red tones. And as you can see here, all the dark areas are now getting reddish. So that's something you need to keep in mind. So this is what we call a color lookup in Nuke. And a color lookup is nothing more than a curve that you can find in Photoshop or you can find it on any other application. And so if you think about it as the values, if you look at this kind of square, you can kind of see that these values here are set to zero, which is the dark black. And then you have the middles, which is the values you see here from 0, 01 to 0, 05. Uh, I'm actually going to zoom in a little bit here so you guys can see it a bit better. Um, so you see here you have basically 0, which is pure black. Then you have uh, 0, you know, 2, 0, 3, 0, 4, 0, 5, which is pixels of that value, and then all the way to 1. And so you see the curve here uh, doesn't at the moment have any other points. For, for example, if I put a point on the middle here, and maybe I can even put points on the other two middles as well and now so now you see if I start moving around with the center curve you see what I'm actually doing here am I'm, I'm actually moving the gamma so if you look at the vector scope here you can clearly see that I'm changing the midtones of the image so that means that whatever pixel was 0, 05 on that area now is 0, 06 and so the same way that if I move my actual highlights you can see on the window here, I can actually show you, you can see that it gets, wait, sorry, it gets much brighter or it gets much darker as well. Same deal again, you can kind of see on the vector scopes that the highlights are actually coming down on that corner. You can kind of see them in this area here. And so that's kind of how I want you to kind of think about it. And of course, the dark areas would be here. So for example, if I lower all the values to zero to below zero, of course, I get pure black. And so keep in mind that the different areas of the image have to do with this curve. So now let's jump into another application, just see how that could work. Now, most of the people kind of think that uh, applications are all very different, but actually they are not. The thing to be keep in mind is that these concepts can be used on any application. So try to be software agnostic. It will always be giving you the biggest chance to actually have work and to work on as a visual effects artist or even as a grader or a colorist. So you see, for example, on this photo, this is just a photo of my desk, of the desk that I'm recording this right now. You can kind of see that you have some really bright areas, really dark areas with blacks and, of course, the midtones. And just like in Nuke, in Lightroom or in or in Photoshop, you kind of control the light with the exposure node. Now, the exposure node, again, is like you see in the Instagram here. It's actually affecting the highlights only. So you can see that my blacks are still black. You can kind of still see that it's all black here. And as I bring in the highlights, you can kind of see that almost nothing else is affected. Now, of course, this, um, I'm just going to put this normal, the same goes for the lift. So the, the, the lift in Nuke is what we would call the shadows inside Lightroom. So you see, if I improve the shadows, I'm basically giving values to the dark areas, which is what the lift was. And then, of course, is the same thing with the highlights. The highlights are the actual top midtones of the of your uh, you know of your image. So if you think about highlights being really 
really bright, then the highlights on a picture you can kind of lower them. Of course, you need to be careful, especially in here on this area here. You can kind of see that you're now bringing it so low that it's actually getting clamped. And so, as you can see, both on Nuke or in Lightroom or in Photoshop or even After Effects, things are very much the same. And so that's what I wanted to show you. I kind of want to show you that the basics of color correction, as long as you know what a highlight is, a mid-tone is, a shadow and dark area is, you can kind of get a ray around any compositing application or any grading application. Now, of course, this is just the beginning. This is really 101. I mean, we're going to go much deeper. This is like just the start of it. Now, of course, keep in mind, not always everything is beautiful like you just saw. So here's an example of a piece of footage that I recorded last year for a short film that I directed in Sweden with my students at Tech Show uh, and Campus I-12. This is a short film called Oak Lake, which we just did a trailer, and you can check out the trailer on below. Now, uh, this uh, particular shot was shot on a hotel, and it was shot with a Blackmagic 4K camera, which is an older, va older camera, which has a much smaller uh, latitude. It only has 12 f-stops of latitude against the 15 f-stops of the Ursa uh, Pro that I'm actually filming this tutorial with. Uh, so the range is really monumental. Like if you look at, for example, these values here, it looks all good. And if you look at the vector scopes, you can kind of see that these highlights are there. Now, if I start using the multiply down, I can lower some of the highlights. But as you can see, there is, uh, by looking at the actual image here, you can clearly see that there is a gap. It's almost like it's cut. The reason it's cut, it's because it's lost all of its dynamic range. And so there is no more image here because we've reached the sensor's limit. This is a still from a short film that I supervised a few years ago. Uh, it's basically a short film directed by Peter Lavolzi, and it's called Leonard in Slow Motion. Uh, which actually stars Martin Starr, which is a, a very good actor of uh, fame of Silicon Valley. So this image has actually everything. It has highlights, it has midtones, it has dark areas. And so if you use the grade node, you can kind of see that I can lower the highlights of the lamp there. You can clearly see that I can recover. You can actually see it really well here on the on the vector scope. You see, that's the lamp there. So after a while, you start recognizing the shapes in the vector scope. I really recommend you to getting a vector scope. Now, don't use Nuke's vector scope. Nuke's vector scope is, 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 is rough. So as you can see here, you can clearly see that this is Leonard here, and this is the lamp, and this is the sofa. You start recognizing the values in the images actually in the in the thing. And so you see, if I start lowering, you can kind of clearly see that the lamp now has every single uh, latitude. Now this piece of footage is from a red camera. The red cameras have an enormous, it's a red epic, it have, they have an enormous latitude of, of dynamic range. So you can kind of see that nothing is lost against the footage that you just saw saw from Oak Lake where you actually have a clipping problem. You have a clipping issue. Uh, and this is the same thing if I would have put a clip here. So imagine if I would have put a clamp, which is a node that basically clips everything white to black. It basically clips all values from one to zero. You see here, now it has a clip in the lamp. So that's what you don't want. And as you can see here, the, the actual resulting image is very bad because instead of having all this kind of nice tonality of orange, you lose it and it's all clamped. I'm sure you've seen this before when you start doing color correction with GoPro footage or if you start doing color correction with 5D footage, you see this immediately. So keep that in mind, you know, uh, your color correction is always only going to be as good as the footage that someone gives you. Keep that in mind. Now, if we're going to go a step further, imagine that we don't want to just color correct just with the basic, basic values of just having lifts, multiplies, and gammas. So in Nuke, there is another node called the color corrector. Now, the color corrector is basically a node that has a lot more values and a lot more ways of you actually doing certain types of color correction. It still has a master area, which is the saturation, contrast, gamma, gain, and offset. And now the color corrector node in Nuke is much more used for creative color correction. So it's not as much used for something like the grade node, which is to, to basically fix an image. And so that's kind of how you should always think about it. The grade node to fix something that is not correct, 
that maybe it was a mistake on set, and then the color corrector for a creative look. And so the color corrector, of course, is split between master, which is the main, main color correction, then you have shadows, midtones, and highlights. So this one is even more deep. So imagine when you look at the curve node that I was showing you in the curve tool. So in here, it's almost like imagining that not only you have, you know, the grade node, uh, you have control over, you know, the, let me just put the two dots there. So you have control over the shadows or lifts, you have control over the highlights, and you have control over your midtones or gamma. Now, this node, because it's split between shadows, highlights, and everything, it's almost like you would have multiple controls everywhere. So it's almost like thinking about, you know, in the shadows, you have the gamma, the gain, and the offset, the offset being the lift, which is the shadows. So, for example, in the shadows, which is the dark area, which is kind of like down here, you now have the possibility of using the midtones of the shadows, of using the darks of the shadows, and using the highlights of the shadows. Now, keep in mind that the highlights of the shadows, which is the gain of the shadows, are very close to the uh, offsets or darks of the midtones, because the darks of the midtones, because the midtones would be in the middle here, that means that the, the darks of the midtones would be down here, the actual midtones would be in the center, and the highlights of the midtones would be here, which is what we talk about the gain. And then, of course, on the top spectrum, we have the darks of the highlights, which is basically the highlights of the game, of the gamma, and then you have the gamma of the highlights, and of course, the highlights of the highlights. So that's what this node does. It splits the image in several sections so that you can easily call it corrected. And so if you look back here, the way it works is like this. You, you're going to basically have the color corrector here. And as you can see here, I can, of course, do the midtones like I was doing with the other image. And I can see it in the scopes here. You can clearly see them moving around um, in the midtones. You can clearly see just the highlights. You see now I'm affecting most, mostly the lamp on the back there. And then, of course, I have the offsets, which is my shadows. And now the offsets are basically introducing some kind of gray or some kind of whitewashing in the dark area areas. Now, the cool thing with this is that now on my shadows, I can control the midtones of those shadows. And now I can actually control the highlights of those shadows as well. So it's much more pronounced. It's much more fine detail color correction. Now, keep in mind, of course, that you do have the ranges as well. The ranges, if you click testing, it's basically giving you the opportunity to select what you think is the midtones, the highlights, and the shadows. So, for example, in here, you can clearly see that the colors are representing the highlights and the shadows. So, if I now, for example, move the highlights down or move the highlights up, I'm actually telling Nuke that the highlights are actually bigger range. So, for example, if I do it all the way here, that means I'm saying that the highlights starts on 0, 2 almost. It actually has the value there, you can kind of see. So this is basically giving Nuke's information of where my highlights start and also where my shadows end. So for example, the shadows currently are in 0, 0, 8. So every pixel that is below 0, 0, 8 is considered on the shadow area. So if I, if I increase this, now of course I'm going to affect the shadows as 0, 1. That means that when I go in back to my color correction, my shadows, when I affect the gains, the gammas, and the offsets, I'm actually affecting pixels all the way from 0 to 0, 1. And on my highlights, I'm affecting all the pixels from 0, 4 to 1. Of course, the midtones is everything that is in between. The midtones is everything between 0, 4 and all the way to 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 9. So keep in mind that this is almost like a keyer to pick the, to select the areas that you're uh, giving notice to Nuke, okay? This part is, this area here, all the values from 0 to 1, 9 is shadows. All the values from 1, 9 to 1, 4 is midtones. All the values from 0, 4 to 1 is highlights and beyond, of course. This is, of course, going to matter for every image. Like, every image is going to be different. Every image is going to have its own values that you have to kind of set apart. So keep that in mind for the color correction. Now, this color corrector, when we go deeper like this, it, it I'm actually going to open, um, I'm going to open Lightroom again to show you um, how that could work. 
Now, for example, going back to Lightroom, as you can see, this is an actual photo that I took at E3 this year uh, of Mario. And so the same way we splitted the highlights, uh, midtones, and shadows areas by three sections. So where I would have the midtones of the midtones and the, I know this is getting a bit confusing. I'm sorry about that. Uh, and of course, the highlights of the highlights and the highlights of the shadows. The same thing can, can be done when you look at the actual Lightroom. So in Lightroom, basically what happens is that you have the exposure and the contrast that are basically the full uh, values. But then you see here that you actually have a huge division. You actually have the highlights. So the highlights or basically, you know, as I lower my exposure, you see that I still have quite a lot of range because this is a shot done with a 5D Mach 2. So it has a huge latitude. It, it's, it's like it's beyond 10 bit imaging. So you see, I can lower my exposures, but that is a, basically lowering the entire image. Now on the highlights would be just the top, top, top highlights. So see if I lower them, you can kind of see that I'm basically recovering some of the information that we've lost. Now you need to be careful as I lower too much, you start to lose some of the, you start basically de degrading the image. You have to be careful with that. The same goes for the shadows. Now I have the shadows which allow me to actually basically change basically the dark areas. So if I go here, down here to this guy, I can actually recover most of that image and actually see him. Of course, I'm going to get a lot of grain, but I can actually see more of him. And the same goes for the black. So the black still allow me to even push the darks even further. The same way we saw it in Nuke, you can kind of see that there is a curve here as well. So this curve is literally the same curve as you saw in Nuke. But you see here, it actually even helps you with this. It actually tells you that this area here is the shadows and actually it highlights it there. I, I really love sometimes Adobe with these kind of things uh, because they're really, really user friendly. So as you can see here, this area here is the shadows, which as Adobe says, it's between 12, you know, all the way to the darks, which is 22%. So you see the shadows or that area in Nuke that we were talking about, if I switch to Nuke really quickly, um, you see the shadows are basically the area that we talked about, which is this area here with these nodes here with the shadows so going back here. And it all goes away all the way to 22. Then from 22, we go to the darks, which is the dark area all the way to 37, 49 and 53, which are now the midtones, which he considers are the lights. And then we go here all the way to the highlights, which start on 90%. Now, the difference is that, of course, in here, I can't really pre-select. So, but you see, if I start moving around these curves here, I can clearly see that I'm affecting the dark areas only in here. I can darken them up. I can actually affect just that area there as well, which is the lights. You can kind of clearly see them on the curve here. And of course, I have my highlights, the top, top highlights, which are the brightest pixels of the image, and then the shadows, which are the darker images here as well here, which allow me to contrast the image. So keep all that in mind. I know I'm repeating myself, but this is a lot more tricky than you think when you start really thinking about it. So just to prove my point, how this is all so connected, just really, really quickly, let me just go to DaVinci here. So this is DaVinci Resolve, uh, which is free, by the way. You can go and download it if you want, or it comes with the camera, just like when I bought the Blackmagic, it came with the camera. And so once you're in DaVinci Resolve, it's the same thing. Once you have this clip, this is exactly the same clip. The only difference, though, is that it seems much better much darker, doesn't it? So I'll, I'll explain to you in a minute about why that's happening. So if I open Nuke, I'll, I'll show you exactly what I mean. So you see in, in Nuke, you can kind of see that the sphere is really, really bright compared to DaVinci. Um, and so for example, if you look at DaVinci, it looks much more f washed out. The reason for that is because DaVinci is actually does not have a LUT system on top of the images. And this is, of course, something that we'll talk about on later episodes, but I just wanted to mention to you, that's why it looks different. Because DaVinci, you're used to in DaVinci applying LUTs per clip or applying LUTs per sequence. It doesn't really have a LUT on the viewer because it's a color correction tool. And a LUT, 
is basically a color correction. So so keep that in mind. And for example, if in Nuke, you know, the problem of this is that the problems that are happening here is that Nuke's default LUT is going on here. So if you look at above here on the top, you can kind of see that there's a lot of none, uh, sRGB, Rec 9 or Rec 1886. Now, DaVinci works with a none uh, LUT, so there's no LUT applied on top of the image. Um, and of course, this is still looks wrong. And the reason it looks wrong is because uh, in Nuke, the LUT is being applied by the color space. So you're actually imp importing a color space into the image. You're basically putting the Alexa V3 log C into the image. And now what you do need to do is you need to linearize it because in Nuke, everything is linear color space. There is no notion of 8-bit or 16-bit in Nuke, not like in After Effects. Um, whenever you work in Nuke, it's always 32-bit float, always, at all the time. Because of that, you have to linearize your images. You have to convert them to linear. And the way it, it, it works inside of Nuke is that for the Alexa footage in, in specific, you would have to put um, a lot. So basically, I would have to download. Um, usually what I do is I, so this is a software called Addy Color Tool, and it provides you LUTs for all sorts of cameras. And basically, you can export the LUT from there. Uh, I've exported the LUT already, so I'm, I basically have the LUT, and then I can import it back in in using the vector field, which is a node that allows you to import LUTs. I have the LUT already here, and so if I apply it to my footage, um, the only thing I need to do is basically tell them, okay, color space in is Alexa V3 log C, color space out is linear, so it's linear right. So now, if you look at my piece of footage, it looks almost identical to Da Vinci's piece of footage. Now, on Da Vinci, I would also have to apply the LUT from Addy in it as well. So I would have to go here, just a second. And so now I have applied an Addy LUT to Rexin09. And now if you look at Nuke, I have an exact match. So now I'm both looking at the image in Nuke with the complete uh, image using um, a conversion from Addy to Rexin09 so that I can actually see the image as it was shot. Basically, this is now matching what I, was, I saw on set if you did have the monitor set to Rexin09. I know I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, we have plenty of time to talk about this on later episodes of Hugo's Desk. So I do promise I will do a LUT in a color space uh, tutorial later on. I think we're getting ahead of ourselves. So let's just go back a notch and go back to DaVinci and just talk about this. The reason I went to DaVinci is to just prove my, to yourself that it's all the same. So you see here, same kind of principles, lift, gamma, gain, same thing, lift, includes the lift of nuke or shadows in adobe lightroom so you see here if i change oh sorry if i change the lift you can clearly see the image gets lifted just like in nuke you're lifting the shadows or the dark areas if i go to my gamma i'm affecting the mid tones of the image so i'm affecting the mid section or the skin tones if i go to gain i'm affecting just the top image so i'm basically brightening or lowering the highlights, just like you saw on the lift on the highlights, or um, in the multiplication inside of Nuke. Now, I'm just gonna give you a little note before we actually do a little small exercise. Um, this is a piece of footage um, shot for the Homefront uh, Revolution trailer that I made last year, uh, that I directed last year for Fire Out Smoke together with Will O'Connor and. Um, I just wanted to show you why we actually sometimes film these graphs. So this is Thomas Wald, uh, the VFX supervisor uh, and director and also head of marketing at Stellar Studios. And he's having a coffee while he's shooting a gray uh, scale in white card chart for me. And why do we do these things? And uh, one thing, whenever you have a chance to be on set, always try to do this because it's just going to give you really quickly how that's done. So if you look at the values of white here, the values I'm having is 0, 04, 0, 05, 04. Now, I can clearly see that because we are in a green screen stage, you can clearly see, um, actually, in my vector scope here, you can clearly see that there is a huge tint of green 
clearly see, of course, that's normal because uh, there is green on this image, you know, like clearly it's a green screen. But there is an offset in the middle here. You can kind of see that there's almost no values on actual pure white. Um, you can kind of see that on even on black and white. It's kind of like matching the greens pretty much. And the reason for that is because red, green and blue are actually not matching. Um, as, as they should with whites, you know. So one little trick to do is when you use the grade node, you see that there's the two, these two things here, the black point and the white point. Now the black point and the white point are literally ways for you to tell the grade node what is the whitest point, what is the blackest point, and then it basically compresses the image until it kind of gets correct. And this is really important because when you have an image that has tints, you want to correct them before you do your creative color correction. And so the cool, the beauty thing about having charts is that I can literally just color pick something. Uh, this chart doesn't have blacks, unfortunately. Uh, I don't think I have the footage for that anymore. But I'm just going to show you with the whites. So if I color pick just the white, you see immediately I get a color corrected image with pure white. And so now if I look the values much closer, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, like 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 9. There's a little bit of blue there. And as you can see, when I disable my grade node, you can clearly see that the center image there, that is now much more in pure white realms. And so keep that in mind uh, when you're doing uh, color correction. Now, if I had pure black, I could have sampled the black as well. Now, I don't have pure black, but I can actually figure it out because if I increase my gamma uh, or even increase my f-stop, I can kind of find out what's the darkest area. So you see the darkest area in this image is under his uh, shirt here. So I now can actually uh, color pick under that section there and that will give me the black points and so if i now look at the image now my black point is also corrected so now i have pure blacks and pure whites uh, all the way to one zero into one and so now this is a color corrected image and now it's a much bigger much better image for you to start it's a very common practice when you're using davinci or using base light for you to actually uh, bake, make the images flat and make the images like based whites and blacks so that they have proper color correction. So shooting a chart on set really uh, allows you to have automatic color correction pretty much from every tint in case the black point and the balance of your camera was not set correctly. So before we apply some of the concepts we've been talking about, uh, I wanted to just um, uh, take this opportunity to give you a uh, little tip. So if you guys want to know more about compositing uh, and color correction, you should definitely get uh, Ron Brickman's book, The Art and Science of Digital Compositing. This book is truly amazing and it has entire chapters that are dedicated for color correction. And it's a very technical book. It's really good for you guys to have a look. If you guys want to check out, you can also check out the Visual Effects Society Handbook. This book also uh, has a lot of really good uh, pipelines. It, it actually gives you insight of how companies work in terms of film, color correction, and grading. Entire chapters, it's quite a big book. Uh, don't try to read it all in one go. Uh, it's very, very dense, uh, but it's a really good book. And last but not least, uh, my good friend Steve Wright, he has a really good book on compositing. He does have a new edition. You should check it out on Amazon. Uh, and again, he's the master of compositing and he will give you and guide you through color correction, LUTs, uh, grading, uh, very deep and very in-depth inside this book. You should definitely check it out. But without further ado, let's just go on with this. So this is an, an, a sequence, a really short sequence. Um, you know, I just want to give you some examples of how to do color correction inside of Nucor or any other application. Um, now, this is uh, from the fields. I didn't do the grading on this film. I only did the visual effects. I was a supervisor and lead compositor on it. Uh, but I am going to imply some of the color correction techniques that I use these days when I direct my own projects. So for the, for the beginning, I'm going to actually look at this and start uh, assessing what's going on. Going on. As you can see, I have two sections here, which is a primary color correction and a secondary color correction. Now, the idea behind that is primary, primary color correction is for you to actually fix problems, you know, making sure white balance is correct, making sure uh, blacks are correct. And then once you move on, you move on to secondary color correction, which gives you the opportunity to do creative compositing, creative color correction, and also to put masks in. Of course, this is a very old fashioned 
certain way of working, but I'm really used to color, color correcting like this uh, from back in the day when I used to use color from Apple to do color correction. I was very used to this kind of methodology. But if you look at DaVinci, it kind of works this way as well in Bazelite as well. So as you can see on the vector scopes here, you can clearly see that there's a really big highlight on the window. So I'm going to, if I lower my f-tops, you can clearly see because this is an Alexa piece of footage, it's very, it still has a lot of detail. It's quite um, a huge dynamic range there. So uh, I need to fix that before I even start the color correction. Always try to fix your footage first and then do the color correction, trying to make the footage flat, trying to make the footage correct. Uh, and this of course goes between shots as well. If you had 20 shots, in this corridor, you would want to make sure that all your primary color correction is the same throughout all the shots. The other thing that also happens, you clearly see not only the window in this area here is very bright, and then you can see that there is a small bright area on the actual, uh, 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 you know, the actual wall here. You can kind of see these points, uh, and then you have, of course, his head and the hand, which are, of course, much darker. Now, if you look at the vector scope, you can clearly see that there's an offset of magenta and reds. It's kind of like off-centered, and that's because the image is not fully white and black. You need to kind of color correct it back into its place. The way I'm going to do this is I'm going to put a grade node here. I'm going to start by effectively telling a Nuke uh, where the black point and the white point is. So I'm going to start with the white, with the black point. Now, for it's first to see the black point, Literally, you just have to increase the exposure to maxim, uh, and that kind of provides you an insight of what's the darkest on the image. So in this case, I'm gonna color pick, um, I'm actually gonna color pick some something like this, a few pixels here. Now there's a lot of noise on this image, so of course you need to pick a bunch of pixels, otherwise you're gonna pick a specific color, so you need to be careful with that. Um, so that's the black point, uh, and then the white point, you're basically going to basically lower your gamma to try to see the saturation. Now, there is one thing you cannot do. You cannot pick the white point from the window. Remember, the window is being affected by the sun, which has a different temperature. And then inside the corridor, we have the temperature of the lamps of the corridor. So you have to be careful. Uh, so you want to kind of affect the light inside this room because that's where your action is happening. You can always call a quick window separately. So you see the brightness thing is actually this wall. So I'm going to pick up the, the white point and I'm going to sample a section of that wall. If I bring back my viewer to uh, as it should and look through the viewer, you can kind of see that now I used to have an image that was very much in the scopes here. You can kind of see that that we had like a um, uh, tonality of, um, you know, very much leaning into reds, and now we have much more centered color. Of course, it's brighter. That's the issue we have to deal with as well. It's a bit too bright, but now whites are whites, blacks are blacks. They don't have any tints. It's very important for you to color correct without any tinting whatsoever. The tints could come from the camera. Maybe the white balance is not correct, or it could come from bad treatment of the footage. It could come from wrong color spaces. I've, I've gotten things from all sorts of types of things. Uh, so, with that in mind, I'm actually going to lower the multiplication a little bit, just to try, so that I can lower uh, as it was. So, if I look at my vector scopes, you can see that before we had basically um, a range between the values of the highlights there. So, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to lower my multiplication so that I have a similar tonality of what I had before. Um, it doesn't need to be perfect, but as you see here... By looking at the vector scopes, it's very close now. You know, it's just a little bit brighter, but it doesn't really matter. Um, so it's just a bit, bit less bright. And of course, now instead of having this tint of red, it actually is white. So this is now my primary color correction done. The other thing that I'm going to fix is this window here. I could try to fix the window with a color correctors because I can pinpoint that highlight. And so if I go to the ranges, I could go in here and say that my highlights are a bit bigger, my shadows are a bit smaller so I have a bigger range and then in here I could try to recover that window by using the gamma only on the highlights could do that um, making sure that I don't affect anything else on the image um, so I'm just gonna look into this so you see I'm kind of recovering just the window 
But the problem with the color corrector is that it's very harsh. So you see, as soon as I start harshing too much, you start getting these edges, which is not good. You start getting these really bad edges because that's, of course, you're reaching the limit of the dynamic range of the image. You have to be careful with that. I'm not going to lower this much, so I'm going to just make make it a bit more subtle. So maybe I'm going to lower just 20% in here, and then I'm going to put a grade node here. I'm then going to use a radial. Uh, you'll see that I use radials a lot. I like radials. Radials are a great way for you to pinpoint a mask without having to do a mask. So I'm basically going to just select that area of the image there, and then I'm going to attach it to that grade node. Of course, this radial will have to be animated or tracked. And that's simple. I just put a tracker. And again, we can do this on DaVinci. We can do this on After Effects. It doesn't really need to be done here. But if I attach the tracker, and basically it's only 40 frames, I'm going to just put a tracker here, uh, attach it to one of these corners here, um, you know. Uh, so I'm just going to put a tracking marker there. That should be enough. It doesn't need to be perfect track anyway. And then I just track the whole thing. When tracking, don't forget to put the little lamp so you can kind of see the quality of your track. You can see that there's a slip at the middle section. So I'm going to just go back a bit and I'm going to track it again from there. And so now I have a much greener track. Uh, it doesn't really matter if it's not perfect. So once this track is done, now I can attach it to my... Uh, so this I'm just going to keep making sure that I know what I'm doing here. So this is the radial um, of the window. So that's going to be that track. Um, I'm going to leave it up there, up here. Now, the thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to transfer the tracking data. So a couple of ways of tracking, transferring the, the data, you can actually express it or you can copy it over or you could just literally uh, just go to the first frame, copy the tracker, paste the tracker into the radial uh, and then basically say you want a current frame and basically you want to do a match move and now your radial should move with your image. Now, be careful with the fact that the radial is being cropped at the moment. Um, so I want to make sure my radial is all inside the image. I'm just making sure it's not cropped um, so that I don't have uh, an image that is cropped and tracking. And then I track it and now it should move with the image. It's all good. Now I'm only I'm only gonna actually just move the radial. So if I now start lowering my multiplication, kind of see that I'm affecting the radial there, which is the wrong place. I'm only I'm only gonna really quickly just put a transform node and just move the radial to the window so it doesn't get cropped. So I'm gonna put it just right there. Um, and then of course the grade node can't be this harsh. This is a bit too much. So the, the whole point here is that you see, because I've done a grade node with a radial, I don't get these weird artifacts that I was getting with a color corrector. So the grade node made a much better image. And as you can see, if you look at the scopes now, you can clearly see that I have now salvaged that section and recover that quality. So that's now good. So for me, in, in terms of primary color correction, this is now done. I have uh, done an image that has white, good white balance. One thing I'm going to do is, because you see that you can kind of see the props of the lights there, uh, this was supposed to be done as a 235 aspect ratio image anyway. So I'm going to put the bar so that I don't have to look at that. So it's, it's a much more cinematic look. So you see, I've recovered that. I've recovered um, uh, the white balance. There's still a few things to do. But now I'm going to start doing some creative color correction and creative choices. So first off, I tend to do one thing when I do these kind of projects. I tend to focus on, you know, just like a color corrector would do in Base Light or in DaVinci, usually colorists or grade artists, they, they tend to fixate on the language of the actor and they try to fixate on the actual message that is being told. So with that in mind, I'm going to put a grade node and I'm going to, again, use another radial um, and I'm going to try to uh, recover some of the face. So I'm going to make sure that this grade node actually says face. So it's, again, uh, secondary color correction is basically when you start using masks. So I'm going to put this radial right on his face and I'm going to start putting up some gamma up so that I can actually have a bit more face um, visible in the image. 
Um, I also am losing a bit of contrast, so I'm going to actually put a color corrector here as well, attached to the same mask, and I'm just going to contrast it a little bit so I recover the contrast. So, of course, this now needs to be animated. You don't really need to track it. You could track it, of course, but, you know, sometimes it's faster to just animate it by hand, especially on a sequence this short. So I'm probably just going to fixate it on his nose and just kind of animate uh, in between uh, frames here. Again, this can be done in After Effects or DaVinci. You don't really need to do this in Nuke. Um, I'm basically trying to teach you some techniques that you can use on any application by keeping and sticking to your principles of multiplication, highlights, gamma, and midtones. So in here, what I did on his face was I basically improved the highlights and the midtones, and then I made a bit of contrast. And, and already out of, out of the bat, you can kind of see that this was on my original image, and this is my new image. So as you can see now, the spectator was looking at the window. Now the spectator is not looking at the window anymore. Now they're looking at him. And the window is a secondary section, which is really what you want. Except if there was an actor there, then it would have been different. But the main shot here is to look at him. So I've improved the actual quality. Of course, now we're getting a bit too much saturation, but we have to deal with that as well. I'm going to put a, so that I can see it on my black magic out here. I'm actually going to put a 245 aspect ratio on the back there so I can actually see it on my scopes and I can actually see it on my black um, on my BenQ uh, monitor as well. So if we, so as I said on the beginning of the, this video, uh, I'll show you in a bit in a bit, but I'm using the BenQ Technicolor uh, approved monitor for color correction and then I have of course the BenQ uh, another BenQ 4K monitor here uh, to do my uh, desktop and it's fully calibrated. They're both matching and I have a perfect match between the two of them. This third monitor here of course is just for the scopes. Um so with this in mind, now that I have done a bit of creativity, I'm going to actually do a, a, a more harsh color correction. I'm going to put a, a color corrector here. Um, I'm actually going to call this a creative grade. I'm going to go into my ranges. I'm going to make sure my midtones or my darks are a bit smaller and my midtones are a bit wider because the image is not as strong. Um, and I'm going to now... Uh, start doing some color correction. Now, this is a sci-fi film, so I'm going to go into the cliche of going into my mid-tones, which is just the skin tones and the uh, gray areas of the image, and I'm going to go into my mid-tones and just start fiddling around with some color. So I'm going to basically introduce some green tint, just like the Matrix, you know. Uh, I know it's a bit 90s, but just gives it a bit of a green tint. Uh, it might be a little bit too much, but I'll go back to that. Then, as well, I'm going to remove some saturation from my image, just a little bit, uh, so that I have uh, a bit less saturated image. I'm basically taking away about 20% of saturation. And then I'm going to push the contrast a little bit further. So, as you know, probably contrast is always by crunching the, you know, if you look at the scopes here, you can kind of see what contrast does. Um, you see, contrast with level like that, what happens when I start contrasting a lot, I start sliding this value here, you can kind of see what happens is my highlights go all the way up, my blacks go all the way out. So basically what contrast is doing is basically extending the midtones and compressing the blacks and the whites. That's what contrast is doing. It's like a, a constantine effect on the image. Um, so it, you always have to be a bit careful with contrast. So I'm just going to contrast a little bit. Of course, now I have, uh, of course, created problems here with the window, uh, created problems with the glove since you don't see it anymore. So now I'm going to push up the uh, highlights a bit, and then I'm going to go into my midtones. Remember, I'm going to go into my midtones and control the highlights of my midtones by lowering because I want to lower this window here. So I'm going to just lower a little bit. So now you see I've recovered just the highlights of the midtones tones without affecting him uh, so this is actually uh, basically the highlights of the mid of the mid tones then i'm actually in going to increase the overhaul mid tones to get a more a cohesive image and then I'm going to go to my highlights. I'm going to just lower by like 10% a little bit. And then on my shadows, I'm going to actually increase my shadows a little bit more and push a bit more highlights on the shadow so that I can recover the glove a little bit. Now, this is a bit too much, so I'm just going to keep it like that. So now, as you can see already, we have... And of course, keep, keep in mind, guys, that this is a creative process. What I'm doing here is a grade that 
I like, you know, I'm kind of, and of course I'm doing a fast grade, it's a quick grade, it's like a 10 minute grade. So you guys might have other visions on this, you know, you might want to do it as a 70s look, or you might want it to do it as at a, at a blue tint. So it's not about the final color correction, this tutorial is to just give you a pipeline. Um, so now that I have that, I'm just going to look at my uh, final and results. So you see, before we looked at the window, he was very red. It was all very tinted red. Now we look at him. We don't look at the window anymore, and we have a bit more contrast. Now, the only thing I'm going to now start doing is I'm going to go into the face again, and I'm just going to increase a bit more light on his face. I just think I lost uh, that kind of punch on his face. Um, and then the other thing that I want to do is I think I want to recover some of his um, of his glove. So I'm going to do another secondary color correction here. I'm going to put a grade node here. I'm going to actually put a roto shape this time, not a not a radial. It doesn't need to be a roto shape, but it's kind of good if I show you several types. So I'm just going to basically do a roto shape on this area here. And again, you might be thinking, why are you doing these roto shapes in these really awkward shapes? But if you guys have ever seated on a color correction uh, session in a great suite on Baselight on DaVinci, you know that this is how it works. Um, they track masks all the time. That's really how colorists work. And I just want to try to give you some insight into that kind of world. Now, of course, this needs to be animated uh, so that we follow his hand. Uh, I'm just going to do some keyframes here by hand. I'm not even going to track it again. It's a very short shot. I, there's no point of you tracking it. Uh, it's so, you know, it takes longer to track than actually to do uh, the animation. So as long as you look at it and you can kind of see that it kind of works. So it goes a bit down here. So I need to go a bit high, high here. It's all good. It goes a bit too fast and then it goes there. It goes high again. Yeah, should be more than enough. And so now, and of course, then at the end, don't forget that the hand goes away. So the mask needs to go all the way down with the hand so that it kind of synchronizes with the hand. Um, you don't want to make sure you want to make sure it's actually controlled. So now that I have that, I'm going to just call this grade node the hand. And now I'm actually going to go in here and I'm going to push my highlights so that I have a nicer tone and I'm going to push my gamma Probably not the gum, not the midtones. I'm actually going to lift. So I'm going to get those black areas of the glove and just do it a bit more. Now, be careful with the mask. The mask, of course, needs to be much more um, diffused. So I'm going to just pick it up and actually in make much bigger fallout. So I'm going to just select the whole thing, hit the ripple effect, and I'm actually going to improve my mask by making it much, much bigger and actually much smaller in size so you don't notice it so much. That's the trick here, is to make all these color corrections without anyone noticing it. So you see here, this is already kind of looking much better. I'm actually just going to go in here, put a blur node here. I'm just going to blur that mask even more. And you see, blurring the mask allows me to remove that kind of black edge that I had around it. Um, and so now you see the hand is much more visible. So now, you know, as before, we were looking at him and the window, and now we're looking at the hand in his face. Now, as a final, final thing, I'm basically going to just get a bit more contrast into it. I'm going to just lower the gamma a little bit more so we have a bit more contrast. And now I think I'm going to actually just sharpen the image a little bit because it would be nice if I have a bit more sharp and a bit more crunch look. So I'm going to put um, a lintolog uh, video uh, node here, converting it to log. Then I'm going to put a sharpen node. The reason I'm putting a log to lin is because I want to make sure my sharpen doesn't get broken uh, you know, because if I disable, I've, I've already talked about this on other uh, Yuko's desks, but if I start sharpening, for example, if I put a five sharpen here, you can kind of see that you start seeing black edges around the edges. And so now if I put my lock to lin conversions here, you see the black edges are gone. So you don't have this problem anymore of really harsh edges on the contrast. Um, so that's a good trick to do that. Now, of course, I've, I've revealed a lot of noise. But this is, of course, is, a, is just a, a, an example of what you could do. Like I said, um, I'm not doing a creative comp. I'm just showing you some of the examples of what I would do. And so now if I play this back, 
you see that it's looking quite nice. So you see the ramp attaches to the window, the mask attaches to the hand and to the face. And now we basically focus on him uh, much better. Now, one of the things that I'm kind of seeing is that we're having a huge bright area in the middle there. I think that could be fixed by just either putting a mask there. I think I'm gonna just gonna do a mask there uh, because I think I'm just comp gonna compensate it. Or I could use the mask I already have. Now I'm gonna put a mask there. So if I put a grade node again, uh, no, actually, if I go to this color corrector, yeah, that's right. If I go to the main color corrector we had on the primary color correction, I think that is coming from here. So if I lower, yeah, there you go. If I lower the gamma on my color corrector here, I can kind of lower that section there and it looks much, much better now. Um, I actually also think that maybe the window needs to be a bit lower as well. The window is not as important. I'm also gonna actually put a saturation node here and disable the saturation a lot on the window so we don't look at it more. And I actually think that for me to focus even more on him, I would probably put a ramp as well. Um, ramps are really good tools for color correction uh, because it's a really good way for you to do a, a harsh color correction on a very uh, big piece of image. So I'm just going to put the ramp quite where he is all the way to the to the window uh, where it's white. And I'm actually going to just do that. And then this will give me an opportunity to lower that entire corridor a bit more so that we don't look at it so much. I'm also going to put a color corrector there. And I'm actually going to lower the uh, saturation of that entire thing. And that's it. So I don't want to spend much more time on this, but you can kind of see that even looking at what we've done here, it's looking much better, you see. I would denoise, I would denoise the image, actually, by the way, before I would do this, because I think I, the color correction is really breaking the noise at the, a bit. So I would probably denoise the image, and then I would kind of actually put the noise back. I think that would be the best way. But you see, we had a window which was broken, the face wasn't really relevant, and now it is. And now it looks kind of like, you know, a badass Matrix shot, uh, uh, of course, it's on my taste, if not on your taste, but uh, I think you see how quickly we can kind of put this together. Of course, this is a really small introduction, but just to recap, you can kind of see primary color correction where I basically, you know, go and I. this is the image I have. I start by making sure whites and blacks are correct. I start by fixing some of the highlight issues with the windows and the walls. I then have a pinpointed mask just for the window. I then have some saturation uh, because the window is a bit too much red, most likely because there's a brick wall on the back there. And then on my secondary color correction, I have a color correction on the face to bring back the highlights and the midtones. Then I have some contrast added into the face. If I had the time, I also would fix some of his acne by using a glow and by using a blur. I would mask that. Uh, I can maybe that's a topic for another Yugo's desk someday. So I can show you how to actually do a cleaner skin on the top there. Uh, then I actually have a color corrector pinpointing just for the hand so that we actually can see the hand better. And then I have a ramp that allows me to actually lower the whole thing with the alleyway because it's not as important. And then of course my creative gray, which is a bit of contrast, a bit of green tint, a bit of mid-tones, highlights, and then some sharpen, which is a bit too much. I'm just gonna lower a little bit more. And again, I, I, from now on, from here, I would potentially would use a glow to just do a bit of a diffuse to make it a bit more uh, cinematic. So, and the diffuse would be, you know, it would be literally using a glow. Again, we can, we can dive into this a bit more on the next episode of Hugo's Desk, but just to give you a little idea of what I was talking about, if I put a glow here, uh, for the skins. Uh, I could put it before the color correction as well, but I usually tend to use my glows as merges as screens so that I don't affect the highlights. Um, so I'm going to just put the glow there. So you see what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the glow as effect only. I'm actually going to tolerate the glow much less because what I want is the glow coming from the window and from the wall. Uh, I'm going to brighten the glow much less as well, so it's less powerful. Desaturate the glow a lot more and see what that 
gives me. And so that, as you can see, gives me a little, just a little bit diffuse under his ears. So I get a bit of a light wrap going on here. And especially the window here gets a bit more diffuse and the lights get a bit more diffuse. Um, and that's it. And then it kind of goes back to here. So as you can see, I'm going to just go back to before and after. And so that's my final image. And so that was the original plate we had. Kind of see that there's a lot of issues on the scopes there as well. And now this is the final color correction we've made on the same image. Let, let it just process. And so before, after. I think it's quite successful for like a 15 minute long grade. So this is it for me really. And the cool thing that I really want to emphasize is that because you have this system as long as you label everything, you could potentially use this as a pipeline. You could now move into another shot if you had the same actor and make sure that the radial would be attached to his face. Then make sure that they have, if you have another, uh, if you have another window, you make sure that that radial is attached to the window and making sure this rotor is attached to the hand. So as long as you would reanimate the hand in the two radials to the new shot, Potentially, you could get away with having the same color correction as long as the camera would have the same lighting on that shot. Of course, it's always a shot-to-shot -shot basis when you do color correction. But that is it for me today. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Um, and um, uh, just this a little glimpse of introduction to color correction. And please keep in mind that all these techniques can easily be done in After Effects, Fusion, or DaVinci. So keep that in mind. Try to be software agnostic. And that is it for today. Sorry for the long tutorial, but there was a lot to talk about. I hope you've enjoyed this video. A follow-up will come shortly in the next few weeks. If you want, check out my videos at Hugo's Desk. Follow us in Twitter at Hugo's Desk or follow me personally at Hugo C. Guerra. As always, support my channel in Patreon and thank you so much for watching.